Are we all settling in? Some folks are. Um, thank Tony. Looks like Ruth's singing as well. I was going to lead us in some more worship in just a second. Can I just share a very quick thought? I think it's an encouragement. It is an encouragement for us. When we started worship just a little while ago, the songs we sang, it's like um, we were kind of taken into the, the heavenly throne room, weren't we? We were singing holy, the angels singing holy, 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 Lord Almighty, and all the rest of it. And then the, there's, a, there's a line, the um, line of Judah is roaring with power. And it just the thought came to my mind that actually God is currently, right now, roaring with power in the heavenly realms, accomplishing his purposes. And it's a bit like, we had all lots of pictures of mountains, didn't we? If you go in the mountains in this country, you tend to find yourself in the mist and the rain and whatever quite frequently. And where you often don't see where you're heading, but you know where you want to be going. Oh, but it's like God's above it all. He can see the beginning from the end, and he's still accomplishing his purposes. And we're sometimes in the mist and the fog of all the chaos that goes on the world around, around us in the world. But God is roaring with power, and he's heading for that end game, the, the end goal that he's told us all about in Revelation. So we need to be encouraged that he is roaring with power, even if we don't see it and we feel like we're in the, the fog. He's at work, and we can be confident of that. Anyway, they're going to lead us in worship, and then we've got some questions to answer. Before, before we bring our elders up here and, our, and some of our, our leaders, um, I just wanted to share a verse with you which fits nicely from where Wendy was, I feel, this morning. And it's something that I think I, I've mentioned before in at least one group. And it's from Isaiah 2. In the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be the highest of all, the most important place on earth. So, time for us to be lifted up and shine. It will be raised above the hills and the people from all over the world will stream there to worship. People from many nations will come and say, let us go up the mountain of the Lord to the house of Jacob's God. There he will teach us his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the Lord's teaching will go out from Zion. His word will go out from Jerusalem. I wanted to share that because, you know, we are his church and we are here today spending time with the Lord and spending time with teaching. So in that vein, could our elders and leaders come up and take a pew? We, we were going to try and get a spotlight mastermind style, but it didn't quite work. Right, so as you know, over the last few weeks, we've collected a few questions, some Tough ones and uh, some strange ones. Um, I'm going to start with the kids' questions. So um, hopefully these are the ones you remember putting in. But I'm going to start with the one that has made me laugh most of all. And this is going to go to Mark and Neil because, well, for obvious reasons. Um, biblically, how often should you change your underpants? <laughs> It was Tash, was it? Yes. Children egged on by naughty parents, is it? Anyway. <laughs> I think the verse that sums up the, the genuine answer is actually seek first the kingdom of God and all these other little worries of life. <laughs> Probably come somewhere down the list. But anyway, you remember when Jesus sent out the twelve? What did he say to them? Apart from go preach the gospel and you know, heal the sick, raise the dead and all the rest of it. He said, take nothing with you. Nothing. <laughs> so there you go. I don't know what they did. But, <laughs> so, but one of the commands, of course, is to respect and honour your parents. So that's probably more pertinent, isn't it? But I think, I think Neil might have some practical insights <laughs> from doing trekking ministry in the Himalayas where he didn't take anything with him either. Well, when you have to carry a rucksack with everything you need for the next month, you take as little as possible. So um, changing underwear is a low priority and doesn't happen very often. Let's put it that way anyway. So, <laughs> Yeah, so I did a bit of research on this and I came across something I found fascinating. Hezekiah chapter 3, verses 10 to 11. 
Just as the righteous shepherd tends to his flock, so must a prudent soul tend to the cleanliness of his underpants. For truly I say to you, clean underpants are a shield against the arrows of embarrassment, ensuring one walks in dignity, even amidst the most unexpected trials. That's the word. It's the word of the Lord. Where did you get that from? <laughs> There's an old saying that says cleanliness is next to godliness. Ooh. And um, I think we should all uh, be clean. I'll tell you a little story. When I was in the army, we went on a very big exercise. And um, we had at night time, we had to just sleep on the ground wherever we could. I remember one night I was on a grassy verge and got woken up. There was a big tank rolling by. Never changed my pants for two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't have been the best person to sit beside it <laughs> at church. But I was really glad to get back to the base and have a shower and clean pants. <laughs> I'll pass on that one. <laughs> okay. Who wants to start with this one? If Satan told Jesus to jump off the temple... Where was the temple? Because Jesus was in the desert at the time. Who fancies taking that? Jesus was in the desert. <clears throat> he was there to be tempted by the devil. But we read in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 5 that Satan took Jesus to the top of the temple, which was very high. It's not a long journey because if you leave the temple in Jerusalem, um, it's no more than two miles and you're in the middle of a big desert. There's virtually nothing that grows there. So it wasn't very far for Satan to take the Lord Jesus to the top of the temple. So I think that's the answer to that question. If you're not satisfied, you'll have to come and see us afterwards. <laughs> Is there anything, else? anyone else on that one? There's a very similar question, which is, why did Jesus go to the desert? And why doesn't it mention Jesus eating in the desert? And why doesn't it mention him wearing any clothes? <laughs> <laughs> well, Jesus went to, uh, into the desert after he was baptised. And it was there that he was actually tempted by the devil for 40 days. And there were three very specific temptations that he was, he was given. The one in terms of the temple is just one of them. But uh, trusting in, the temptations related very much to how he was going to conduct his ministry, who he was going to follow. And uh, Jesus was fasting there, the scriptures tell us, in the desert. So he didn't need to eat his substance came from God. And uh, so through that, uh, that period, he was looking to the Father throughout that, that time. And really, you just assume that actually he was addressed. <laughs> you know, that uh, I think you'd be a bit foolish to go into the desert if uh, you, you didn't have your clothes on. Has anyone else got anything? Or? There's an interesting kind of parallel. You remember in the Garden of Eden, Satan says to Adam, did God really say? And he kind of questions God. But he does the same strategy with Jesus. He says, did God really say? And because Adam kind of caved in and failed and said, oh, I don't know, and didn't really think about it, Jesus had the answer and he stood firm. And so at that point, Jesus wins the victory that Adam failed on as well. So that's another... Yeah, the whole desert thing is Jesus, he's... he's triumphant being triumphant as the second adam and he's also being victorious where the nation of israel failed because they were far from faithful in their desert experience but jesus actually is obedient to the father completely so yeah okay it was interesting that the garden of eden gets mentioned there because the next question is why did jesus create us and why did he create the garden of eden <laughs> <laughs> There's lots of arguments over evolution, creation, science, and all that kind of stuff. Um, 
I think actually the, the really most significant thing about what the creation story in Genesis tells us is why we're made, is our, is our purpose. Um, which actually every human being is looking for purpose and significance and value. And God shows us right at the beginning and that he made us. Ultimately, he wanted a relationship with us. The desire was that we would walk with him in the garden every day. That was the desire. So the Garden of Eden was a perfect place where God could dwell and we could dwell. And so that was, uh, I, th I think, a really significant point about the, the creation story that, you know, that actually the Bible wants us to learn and it wants us to take on as the, as the kind of primary aspect of what it's trying to tell us. There are other things there as well, of course. But I don't know if anyone else has anything on that. Okay. Okay, so the next question is to do with how we prepare for a service here on a Sunday. And basically the question is, how long does it take to prepare for a service? Well, there's lots of different things go on preparing for a service. You've got the logistical bits of setting the chairs out and the, the equipment. But I, um, I think it'd be nice to hear how long it takes each of you to think about your sermons. It's going to be very different. <laughs> I know it's going to be. It will be great. I... It, it, and it, it varies significantly. I have had moments, one moment, in fact, when we were in an elders meeting, we had a particular service and we were deciding who was going to be preaching. Um, for some reason, they decided that I was going to. The moment that decision was made, um, it's like the Lord just gave me the message. I knew exactly what it was. I knew the three points. I knew the passage. I, know, I didn't need to do any preparation. He'd given it to me. That was it. Um, I didn't need any notes because he'd given it to me. But there are other times when it takes hours and hours and hours of, of, of kind of... For, for me, often it's in prayer. And so I'll just pray. I'll read the passage that we're looking at and I'll pray and I'll pray and I'll just seek the Lord and pray. And, just, and anything that he gives me, I'll write down. And then, and then, I'll, and then at the end, I'll just organise my notes into something that's sort of sensible, logical, that flows... And, and that's the way it'll work. So it, so it varies hugely, really depending on what the Lord gives you and when the Lord gives it to you. Um, but then, of course, there have been moments when someone will phone up on a Sunday morning and say, I'm sorry, I'm sick, I can't make it. And then, of course, you know, it has to be quick. <laughs> yeah, these, these guys are good at that. I, I'm not so good at that. I think for me, it depends on the topic, the subject, the passage. If it's, if it's, a, if it's a piece of scripture that is very, you know, theologically rich, I have to do a lot of work on that, personally. I take quite seriously the fact that when I'm preaching and teaching, I want, it, I want to get it as right as I can, so that, one, I'm not preaching heresy or sending people off. Um, so this is how it works for me. So I reckon, and on average, I probably prepare between 10 to 15 hours a week. And then on top of that is prayer, maybe study time. And just so you get an insight into what I do, I never like to bring my ideas to the text. I mean, I think we'd all agree with that. So for me, if I've got a passage of scripture, I print it off. So it's just the words on a page, print it off, and then I'll just read it a number of times. And then I'll begin to just highlight words, look for repeated phrases. What is the text actually saying? Observe the text. I don't want to bring anything to it other than what is this text saying? And then I'll just get, you know, praying ideas will formulate. And then I suppose after everything's kind of percolating and going around, you've got some ideas, it's then that I might then go to commentaries or read up on stuff to see if I've gone completely off the path or whether I'm kind of in the right ballpark. But, um, yeah, so for me, it is, a, it is something that takes me quite a while, really. Um, I think there's a general rule of thumb that they say about preparing for preaching and it's an hour for every five minutes that you're speaking but it does vary hugely mm. I'm very much more similar to Neil which isn't surprising um, I think actually it's interesting that it's, it's, in some ways it feels like it's God's grace but he knows each of our characters as well if you had to spend hours studying commentaries I would probably never preach because I've never managed to do it but some people absolutely love it and that's how they really learn things and actually God speaks to them so God speaks to us all differently. And so it, it depends how he communicates with you. And you, often you'll find you, you've got something to preach on and things just pop up. Well, I find that in front of me. Like, and even like, sometimes you randomly open your Bible in the morning and think, oh, yeah, that's the right verse. But, <laughs> so God is very gracious and he, he will speak to you. It's a bit like Wendy was talking about. If we're listening, we're seeking him, he speaks to us. And how that happens can vary significantly. You just have to be prepared to listen 
Sometimes I <clears throat> ask to take a service at short notice. <clears throat> then it becomes quite difficult. To, and the most important thing to do then is to pray. Sometimes I've only got perhaps one or two. Um, uh, so that I spent quite a bit of time praying first and then asked God to direct me to the passage I was to speak from. But um, if I'm preparing for a Bible study, I'm doing a Bible study with the church at the moment, taking them one Tuesday a month. Uh, <clears throat> that I can spend oh, two or three days preparing for that. So that, that's, how, that's how much I'm... Quite a lot of time is spent in preparation. <clears throat> and you know what they say, if you're decorating a house, the most important part is the preparation. When the preparation is done, then actually the painting of the house is fairly straightforward. And I think it's much the same when you're taking a service. The preparation is the most important. I'll add a, add a few things. I think I'm very much in, in Miles' camp on this one. I suppose having uh, preached regularly for probably 35 years, most weeks, there's that sense that you want to do the preparation properly. And my rule of thumb was that it would take me a day in my working week to prepare for Sunday. Some, you know, and that's excluding the times that you spent th thinking, reflecting, praying into a passage. Obviously, because of the nature of the ministry, you were very quickly moving from one Sunday to the next. And often I'd be preaching within a series. And so you'd be doing background reading, whether that's John's Gospel or whether that's Ezekiel. You've got the background reading. But my rule of thumb was that it would take a day to prepare a sermon. But on top of that, you've got to realise also that PowerPoints don't make themselves. And that can be, because I'm very much aware that within our congregations, there are a lot of people who are visual. They're not word people. And so there needs to be something there that actually speaks to them. For many years also, I was responsible for the worship. And so when you're coming to tot it all up, there's probably almost two days of a week for one service. If you were doing two <coughs> services on a Sunday, then it, gives, it raises issues. But God is very gracious. And I guess over the years, you store up things on your hard drive. And there are times when God's word does come in the immediacy. People say to me, you know, that David, often you preach without notes. No, I don't. There's always a full set of notes. There's always notes on my desk or on the pulpit. Because you need that to give structure. You need to give the, the whole essence so that you know where you're going. You've got a route map. You know what you want to say. Someone used to challenge us. They said that a good preacher needs to be able to sum up their sermon in one sentence. And probably they need to leave it at that. <laughs> okay. okay. Question now, um, why did Mary pour olive or perfume on Jesus' feet? Who wants to start that one? Mary was there, at, they were celebrating uh, the resurrection of Lazarus. There was a, a, a dinner in honour of Jesus. And she comes with this, is it a kilo? Of uh, expensive perfume and anoints Jesus. I think, first of all, there was an act of love in that, an act of devotion, an act of, of worship. We were listening a little bit earlier on to being undignified in worship. How much more undignified was it in that culture for a woman to untie their hair and to be seen so dem demonstratively demonstrating love? Because that's what Mary did. 
To untie her hair was the sign of a loose woman. She was just acknowledging Jesus. But there are other things going on. She was anointing him for his, his death, his burial. His burial would have been rushed. But here she had also noted who he was. He, she, she was anointing him as the Messiah. You see, within the society, the priests were the ones who were supposed to anoint the Messiah with oil. But the priests had turned their back. But Mary, humble Mary, saw who Jesus was. And just in that simple act, she was anointing him as her Messiah. I'm sure others can add to it. No. Yes. Okay. That's okay. Well, <laughs> the last question, and I know David's got some really good answers for this, so if you'd like to pass it along. This is, did Jesus eat cheese? Did Jesus eat cheese? I would say almost definitely he did. Um, cheese is only mentioned three times in the Bible. You may remember when David was going to the battlefield, his father Jesse gave him ten cheeses made from cow's milk, to take with him to help feed his brothers who were waiting for the battle to take place. Another time, Jesus, uh, David fled Jerusalem from his son Absalom. And when they crossed the River Jordan, they were met by some very kind men who brought them all sorts of food. And in amongst that food, cheese is mentioned. So, and the other time, Job mentioned it, speaking of his trial and what he was going through, he said, I feel like milk that's curdled, ready for making cheese. That's how he described his experience. So I would say, as cheese was uh, one of those things that's mentioned regularly, I would say the Lord Jesus, he enjoyed his cheese. <laughs> But being holy, he wouldn't have touched parmesan, would he? Anything utterly diseased like that, Jesus would have. I always remember the life of Brian, probably should admit to seeing that film. But when, the, when the, uh, they're overhearing Jesus preaching and he goes, what did he say? Blessed are the cheesemakers. Boy, so that was funny. Anyway, yes. <laughs> okay, I don't know if there are any more youngsters still in here, but um, we're now going into kind of the adult questions. If you want to stay and listen to them, please do. But they might be a little bit tricky. Okay. You ready for this one, Miles? Uh, I'm going to start with question one because I thought that would be obvious. <laughs> right. Did God die? In the hymn by Wesley, there is a line that thou art my God should die for me. And recently in Songs of Praise, there was a focus on a hospice and the founder said that God had gone through death so he knew what those at the end of life were going through. I suppose the answer is tied up in the Trinity. It was God that sent his son to die, but they are all one. Does this mean God died? Okay, so you could say, you know, very quickly... Of course, God died, because if Jesus is one with the Father and he's eternally co-equal with the Father and the Spirit, then, of course, he is God. He's the divine Son. So in that sense, God died. But we have to be very careful when we say that, because people will hear and think, well, if God died, who was looking after the universe or, you know... I mean, there are so many deep the theological things in it, but the, the, the way I've always looked at it, and indeed this issue has been a big issue in the early years of the church, there were, there were heresies based on this, on Jesus, whether or not, you know, he died or didn't die, and the God, did the God part die, but not the human part. And in a sense, you've got to say, well, Jesus on the cross is the God-man. So it, it, clearly he died, so his body dies, but just like all of us, his spirit went to be with the Lord. 
Of course, he is the Lord, but it's one with the Trinity. So it's all, it's all wrapped up in the Trinity. For me, the question is, does God suffer with us? Of course he does, yeah. I think for me, that's the bigger issue. But the, the idea that, that, God see, that God as person ceased to exist when Jesus died, that theologically doesn't make sense because the whole of the creation would have ceased to be in that moment. But the human nature of Jesus dies, but his spirit lived on. Probably haven't explained that too well because that is a deep theological yeah, I don't know if anyone's got anything to add, but I, I, I totally agree. It, in a, yeah. I'd just like, to read, just like to read a verse, a part of a verse from Ephesians chapter 1, which says, he, Apostle Paul wanted the people in Ephesus to know the power, like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead. God didn't die, did he? God was still very, very active. And he was the one who raised the Lord Jesus Christ back to life. So for me, God didn't die. It's quite an interesting question, isn't it? But I suppose it depends a lot on our understanding of the word die. Do we mean that it just ceased? that that was it. In the Bible, death is very much to do with separation. And that there are two deaths. There's a physical death that we all face, and that is the separation of the soul or spirit from the body. And if you think of Jesus, then yes, he was God's son, but actually Philippians tells us that he humbled himself he emptied himself. He emptied himself of his divinity. He came fully human. And there on the cross, there at the cross, he experienced that physical death. He experienced it. He said, John 19 speaks about he gave up his spirit. He gave up his spirit. There's this physical death, but then also scripture talks about the spiritual death. And that is separation from God. The separation that we should face from God. Now, did Jesus experience that? Well, on the, on the, on the cross, he experienced death on our behalf. Even though he was God, he still had to experience the agony of temporary separation from the Father if he was going to pay the full price of our sin, the full penalty. And what is it in Mark 15, those words that come echo? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That Jesus himself, the human Jesus, fully entered into the whole experience of death. But God was separate from that. God the Father was separate. But Jesus, the human Jesus, had to fully enter into that, that complete and utter separation from God, so that you and I don't have to. Yes, we shall experience, all of us, the physical death, the separation of soul, spirit from our physical body, that will live on. But because of Jesus, we don't have to experience that spiritual death. Okay. Thank you. I'm going to move past the next question. We'll come back to that towards the end because I know there's some really powerful things coming back from that one. So I'm going to go to question three. Is it important to read the Bible every day? And are there any thoughts on setting up a plan? <laughs> a few years ago, a Christian lady kept saying to me after her husband died, where is he now? 
It's not the question. Oh, well, sorry. We've, I thought that was the we, question. We, we'll go back to the, that one at the end, because I sorry, think you've, okay. you've got some points, and David's got some points on that one. So if we move past that one for now, and is it important to read the Bible every day, and are there any thoughts on setting up a plan? So part of that is about us reading the Bible. <laughs> well, there you start. The answer is yes. <laughs> well, we all heard what Wendy just shared with us. But I think there's, it's interesting, isn't it, that we, if, if, well, it's not a legalistic thing. If we want to hear God's voice, like Wendy was sharing, and that sketch was powerful, wasn't it? Actually, that's his voice. His word is, he speaks to us through his word. He speaks to us through other means, we know that. So if we want to hear God's voice, it's not a question, do we need to? It's, we want to, that should be our desire. And there's also, God calls us to, I, mean, I spoke about this on Sunday actually, have a renewed mind, a mind that thinks like his. Now if we're spending more time watching the TV, reading whatever, new newspaper or news on your phone or whatever, and listening to voices from the world around us that have a very different perspective to God's, who's going to feed us the most if, if we're not looking at his word? We need to be looking at his word so that we can be thinking like God and bringing that into the situations we find ourselves rather than the other way around. Um, so, most definitely. Um, setting up a plan, and there's loads out there, but I don't quite know where that question's going. What does it mean we should do it? But Pass it on. Um, this guy, um, Smith Wigglesworth, who had someone come into his house who was carrying his daily newspaper with him, and he said, I'll leave that outside. I don't want, don't want that in here. You read the newspaper and you come out dirtier. You read the Bible and you come out cleaner. <laughs> um, in terms of Bible plans, I think I said on Sunday, I've got a couple of books of... Um, by daily Bible reading plans, if anyone wants one. Um, but there are loads of them. There are loads of Bible reading plans. We haven't, we haven't produced one as a church, and I'd probably, we'd, I don't know, we'd, maybe we could. If anyone wants to, uh, I do send something out daily from the Kendrick Virtual, which is uh, Bible reading and Sunday. So if anyone does want a plan, I'm more than happy to set up a group, and we'll do it. We're doing it with the men, so it's fine. It's so easy. Bible reading plans can be a really helpful way of keeping you reading a little bit of the Bible every day. Um, I personally don't don't use them um, because I I have, kind of have my own thing. I, I just want to I just want to read read what I want to read of the Bible every day, and I usually go work work my way through it from beginning to end. So in some ways, it doesn't really matter what plan you follow, whether you follow, follow a plan or not. Just try and get into the Word of God every day if you can. It's going to feed you feed you and teach you and and lead you closer to Him. There's nothing else, is there? Yep. Neil, you said about the, the daily newspaper. There is a line of thought that you should actually read the Bible alongside the daily newspaper mm -hmm. to make, make sense of the daily newspaper. Okay. That we, ne we need both. We need to be aware of what is happening in the world and what is happening around us. But we also need then to take that to God's word. And we do that each day. Okay. Well, this, this leads on nicely into, it's question four on your sheets. Is there a specific passage in the Bible that you read regularly and why? If I, ju if I just take it, we just pass it through, shall we? That's it. Okay, Psalm 23, which I'm sure many of you do, um, has been a passage that has meant a lot to me over over life but if there's one passage that I would go to above all else it's the first chapter in Ephesians because that tells me who I am and what God has done and uh, that always lifts my spirits I love all of God's word so there isn't any I don't have any specific passage I like Paul's letters to the various churches because they're so full of teaching and encouragement. Yeah, I don't have a specific passage. There are things, sometimes there are seasons where you find yourself in a particular passage for a period, and it may be because of what you're going through or whatever. But I can't say it's a particular thing that, uh, that I would always go back to. Um, and, yeah, chapters like Ephesians 1 are <laughs> always great to go back to, aren't they? Um, but there's loads. Um, so I don't, so I don't have a specific thing. Um, I'm kind of similar to Mark, I suppose. Um, I, I 
don't off, I don't regularly go back to one particular passage, but one, I, tend, I do often have something in the back of my mind, a particular passage that perhaps I will refer to every now and again. And for me at the moment, it's Revelation 5. Um, I just love this picture of the worship of heaven and, and Jesus being the focus. Um, it, for me, that's a wonderful passage. But a few, few years ago, it was um, John 15, the, the, about the vine and the branches. Um, so, yeah, just diff- different things captivate my heart at different times. But, yeah, I, lo- I love all of the word of God. Yeah, I don't think there's one particular passage for me either. There are things that stand out. So Isaiah chapter 40 is a regular one I go to because that's the sovereignty of God as creator, all powerful, and yet he's the one that is there for the weary and the powerless. Love that. And for me, I hang out in the Psalms a lot. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the Psalms of Lament because I love the reality of the people crying out to God and finding their strength in him. Okay. Pass it back down the other way. Hold on, hold on. No, no, no. Is there another individual in the Bible, other than Jesus, who you find through their words, actions, or character, you find it easier to associate to? <laughs> Depends on what mood you're in, I think. Um, I think because I've been in ministry quite a, long, quite a long time, really. Almost half my life, is it? No. Oh, boy, I'd never thought of that before. Um, I, I'm sorry... I really hate to say it, but I'm a fan of Elijah, but not in his glorious moment. Elijah in 1 Kings 19, when he absolutely has enough and his disappointment and his disillusionment about how things have gone. And it's the way God deals with him more that I, that I love. So I totally identify with that side of Elijah and also the way God deals with him. I think my initial response is I don't have a particular character that I would associate with um there's loads that i i, I kind of there's aspects of loads of them i love i love i love elijah i love his his boldness but i kind of get to some extent that his his moment of crashing as well and, and but um I, lo- I love i love gideon and in some ways can relate to gideon and his um timidity and and you know thinks he can't do it because I, I think probably probably most of us would find ourselves in that position quite often and then god calls you to something and he has an army of 300 men. He's got to go and defeat the enemy, and it's ridiculous. And, it's, and that's often the way God, what God's asked you to do, isn't it? Something that seems ridiculous. Uh, so I can kind of relate to that, and I think I've um, experienced various moments of that in my life as well. So there's probably a number of people at various times in life that I think, yeah, I, I can see where they were then, and I can relate to it, and it helps me in that particular moment. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think I have a particular person. And Caleb's another one that comes to mind. What's the mountains? Give me the hill country. <laughs> I'm not that old yet. Dad is nearly so. <laughs> but um, yeah, I just love that kind of that that attitude of yeah, you know, I'll take on the biggest in the hill country. It's great, isn't it? Also, I like the mountains. So there you go. Um, yeah, but otherwise, no specific character. I think I like David because of the lovely psalms he wrote. Um, is a psalm there for every occasion. When you're feeling low, when you're feeling angry, or when you're feeling full of the joy of the Lord, there's a psalm there that fits the occasion. So I, I like the character David. I guess for me, I, I would turn to Joshua and Caleb. And Caleb in particular, I've got my epitaph already prepared. He followed the Lord wholeheartedly. And that's what uh, Joshua 14 or Numbers 14 says about Caleb. He was somebody who saw the opportunities and ignored the obstacles. Okay. As God knows the path of our lives from beginning to end, does this mean the choices we make do not affect our lives or his plan for us? Or has he just built in enough redundancy to bring us back to where he wants us? in my hand isn't it yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll admit that's, that's, that's from me that, that's, uh, that, that's, that's it I think we like to, we like to think don't we that, that God knows every little inter, intricate part of our lives and there's a perfect plan for our lives the times I've spent with people who have agonised over that but I want to know God's perfect plan And I just want to say to them, get on with life as it is. You're in God's plan now if you're following him. The psalmist writes 
in Psalm 139, that God knows all the days ordained for me before one of them was written in your book. And it doesn't say that God has got every little detail written down. He's just got the days ordained for me. The length of span of life, if you like. He knows it from beginning to end. If you think of David's life, it was full of rights and wrongs. We could say he went wrong there. He messed up there. He got it right there. He was a real success there. But the beauty of it is that God weaved it all into his purposes. God weaved it, the good and the not so good, the tough and the joyful, the ups and the downs. God weaved it all together. And that's what I believe, is that God weaves all our experiences of life. The, the, the hand that life deals to us, God takes and weaves it into his purposes. Anyone else? Again, I think Wendy illustrated it. We can be going through life completely ignoring God and he's wanting to tell us something. And so it affects, our, affects us, doesn't it? If we're ignoring God, we can't expect to walk in the fullness of his blessing. So... And equally, probably many of us experience that we feel God's nudging us to share something in church and then someone else gets up and shares it. So he can accomplish things, but he might have to bypass you because you're not willing. So, and we've all been there, haven't we? We've all been there. And the overall picture of things, God's already announced what the end is, isn't he? So that's going to happen. And so Jesus asked the question when he returns, will you find faith on earth? And there's... The, as that's the question for us, isn't it? Actually, will we, those who are faithful, all the way through to the end? He'll see it to the end, whether we're with him or not. But equally, I think our part in that he has for us to play in serving him is significant and can have a significant impact on the world around us and the people around us. And it's through prayer, globally, we can have a significant impact. So God calls us to be his people who go with his authority and his anointing and that is very significant, probably more significant than we understand. Um, but equally, he will accomplish his purpose, whether we succeed or fail in that. But we want to be those that are listening to his voice and living in the fullness of his blessing and his call. Well, at least I hope we do. I think there's a danger that we can get so caught up in choosing the right thing all the time. And sometimes there are obviously things that are wrong, which we don't want to choose. But, uh, you know, is it this path or is it this path? Is it this opportunity or this decision? And sometimes we just need to actually go somewhere, you know, if we're someone on the move, that we're more likely the people who God can use. Um, but if, if we're always saying no to everything because we think, I'm not sure it's the right thing or not, you know, it, it's, it's always better, in fact, to say yes. If someone gives you an opportunity to serve God in whatever way it is, say yes, go for it. And you'll soon find out if, uh, if, it's, if it's the thing that God has called you to or not by, whether, you know, but by what happens. So uh, we need to be people who are actually ready to obey him and ready to step out and not just always waiting for this perfect thing that actually it might be just what's in front of you step in it and, and get on with what god is calling you to do now someone here and i can't remember who it was years ago said to me that um if you if if a boat isn't moving i think it might have been a friend who's not here anymore but if a boat's not moving you can't steer it to move and watch where it goes no right we're going to go back to a slightly more difficult question. Can you pass the mic down to David, Jack, please? We've got a more difficult question now, and this one I've left till last, not because it's difficult, but because I think it needs more time. So it's Could very, you... very important that we know and are sh sure. Yeah. Hold on. Yeah. Sorry. Could you, could you tell us more about what happens when people die? Do they go to heaven immediately, or are they raised when Jesus returns? And once Jesus returns, where will we live? in heaven or on the new earth? I'm sorry, I got the wrong end of the stick. That's my deafness. Um, so we have to, I apologize for that. Um, I, I was, it's a very important question that we should know the, this answer to it. As I said earlier on, when I thought that question was being asked, a dear lady asked me about her husband 
who died, he was a Christian, so was she. And yet she, her heart was filled with doubt. She kept saying, where is he now? So I typed out seven different verses in the Bible, in the New Testament, that tell us what happens. And um, I'd just like to read them to you. Um, that would be my answer. I'm sure um, others have got the answers. But um, I, I found this was very helpful for myself as well as for that dear lady when she read them through. It set her mind and heart at rest. So the scripture is there to help us in these situations. Sorry. Um, the scripture is there to help us in those situations. The first one is from John chapter 14, verse 3. And the Lord Jesus said to his disciples, he said, I want you to be with me where I am. With me where I am. In John 17, he prayed to God his Father, and he said, I want those you have given me to be with me to see my glory. I think that's a lovely thing. Something to look forward to, see his glory. In Luke chapter 23, we know about the Lord Jesus when he spoke to the thief on the cross, when he said to him, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said those lovely words. Today, he said, you will be with me in paradise. And that was literally only a couple of hours after the Lord Jesus said that, that that man would have been there because he would have been dead before six o'clock because that was the beginning of the Sabbath. And they'd have to get his body off the cross and they would dump it in the Valley of Hinnon where all the city rubbish was dumped because his family would never come and collect him. But his spirit, his spirit was in paradise with the Lord Jesus. It's a wonderful thing. The Apostle Paul, when writing to the church in Philippi, he said, I I'm, would like to stay with you longer, but he said, I'd rather, he said, be with Christ, which is better by far. Better by far. And then one that the, my favourite, of which I found, is found in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 8. And it, the Apostle Paul says there, we shall be at home with the Lord. At home with the Lord. My Heather's last words it was a prayer she prayed, take me home. And so I had that put on the gravestone here, that she is with the Lord at home. Now, you know, we're very fortunate in England to have the word, the word home. In many languages, there is no word that translates home. I know a bit of German, and my German friends tell me they haven't got a word for it. They simply use the word house, spelled H-A-U-S, but it's house, spelled the same as us. So they're going to their house. But if we're going home, we're going to our favourite armchair, aren't we, with our slippers <laughs> on, and uh, we could just feel completely at ease. We don't have to put on our best behaviour because we're with friends. No, we're at home. I love that one. And then in, um, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and verse 17, there the apostle writes, we will be with the Lord forever. Forever. Remember that. And then in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 10, he says, we may live together with him. Speaking about those who have died, and those who were alive, he says, we shall both live together with him. So those are my answers to that question. Thanks, David. Have any of the elders got anything they'd like to add? Um, no, I, well, what, what David shared is, is brilliant. But I think there's a, ti there's a timing thing on here as well, isn't there, about, I can't, well, I can't well, anyway, about when, when we're going to be with him. Um, and I... And, and my, my, this, is, this is my opinion, so I, you, know, you, can, you can take it or leave it, is that we don't understand the nature of eternity because we're so stuck in time. So, of course, when we die, we're saying, right, I might die tomorrow, and then some, but then Jesus is going to return, we don't know when, sometime in the future. And it talks about those who 
are still alive, being caught up together with those who have died, and then we go to be with him. So am I going to be hanging around in the grave for months, years, waiting for you know, Jesus to return before I can then actually be with him? But well, of course, he says to the thief on the cross, you'll be with me today in paradise. So how can he be there today, which was 2,000 years ago, and yet we're going to be caught up with them, so we're all raised together on the last day? And, and we think it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense in the view of time. In the view of eternity, it does, because it's outside of time. So it actually all happens at the same time. Does that, I mean, our minds can't understand that because we're so conditioned to living in time. Um, I, that might not have explained it, but it may have done. <laughs> um, and then there's also about where will we be in new heaven or new earth. I'm just going to read um, Revelation 21, the beginning of it, uh, which doesn't really answer the question, but in some ways it gives us reassurance. It says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new, a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them and be their God. The, the key thing is, whether it's earth, heaven, whether this city comes down to earth, so earth and heaven are kind of joined, I don't know, we don't really know, and he doesn't really tell us, he's going to be there, we're going to be with him, that's the key thing, you know, it's going to be, in a sense, it's going to be heavenly, it's going to be perfect, whether it's earth or heaven, because we're with, with him. Um, I think the Jehovah's Witnesses have an issue about this, because they say there's only the 144,000 who are going to be in a new heaven, and the rest of us are going to be on the earth. I, I don't think the Bible gives us that, that um, option, it's like we're going to be with him, where wherever it is, it doesn't matter because it's going to be perfect because he is there. We're going to be with him. I think that's the key thing. I would just add that I think the great Christian hope is not we're floating around as spirits like phantoms forever, but we are embodied in resurrected bodies. We will have a physical body more perfect than we have now, just as Christ's body was resurrected physically. God's plan of always having a real earth that's not changed, it's just been marred, and God will destroy the heavens and the earth, but will recreate them. There will be a new earth, and nobody knows what we're going to be doing on that new earth. We might have jobs, work, who knows, but we will actually have bodies to do, and that is the great, to me, my understanding is that is the teaching of the church throughout the last 2,000 years, that there is this great hope of resurrected bodies, you know, it's what Paul talks about. Um, and, and we get that because Christ physically rose from the dead. He, he embodied flesh. Flesh isn't a bad thing. You know, this earth isn't a bad thing. God loves it, but it's marred by sin. But he's in the process of making all things new. And one day we will live and sort of have this sort of experience again, but in a way that we can't imagine. I don't know how it works, but yeah, it's just great. It's a great hope. Thank you. Can you pass the microphone down to David at this end? And I know David's got some powerful bits, bits to share with us. In one sense, I can't add to what's been, been shared. But again, I've sat with many people as they've died. And uh, Paul writes about us falling asleep in the Lord. And so many people actually talk, oh, they look as if they're just sleeping. They're sleeping. And yeah, it's true. I remember one guy in uh, St. George's ITU. He was a great guy, a fantastic Christian. And he speaks probably for a lot of people. And uh, we were there right at the end. It's his death and his family were there. And he, said, and he kept saying, and the nurses were fascinated by this, can you see him? Can you see him? Look, he's over there. He's over there. He's coming closer. And everybody would look and there was, come on, you can see him. He's here. He's here. And he was seeing Jesus. There at that point of death. Because Jesus says, I will come back and I will take you to where I am. Hear that? I will come back and I will take you to where I am. I'm going to make this a little bit more personal. 
Many of you know that actually on the 28th of October, 21, was it, Carol? I caught COVID quite seriously. We had the ambulance out, 3 a.m. in the morning, and I was whisking to the Norfolk and Norwich. My sats were going through the floor. I was admitted into the Brudel ward, which was the COVID ward. For the next 24 hours, my sats kept dropping to a dangerous level. And it came to the point that, um, if you excuse me for a minute, if I just draw on something that I've written. And uh, the nursing staff said very clearly, we have called the crash team from ITU. And they came, and all I heard was that this doctor sitting or kneeling at the side of my bed saying, David, we would take you into ITU, but we can't. I only learnt later that they couldn't because there wasn't room. But I want you to fight. I'm sorry, I'm just, <laughs> I'm just catching Carol. But I want you to fight. And they did various things. They put me onto a drug trial. They put me into the prone position on the bed. And for the next 36, 48 hours, that's where I lie, lay, on the, on the prone position. A lot of things happened. I was in and out of consciousness. I had many periods of lucidity when everything was clear. But alongside those times, there were also periods when I felt I was falling into a giant, dark abyss. And I'm reading this. And I was at the center of a great spiritual battle. It was like I was suspended between two worlds, this world and the next. Looking back, I believe I was passing through the valley of the shadow of death. Psalm 23 came to mean a lot to me. And I rewrote it in my own words, which I'm not going to go into at the moment. To me, it felt like falling into a vast abyss. It was, I was being pulled towards a cavernous black hole. I knew I couldn't allow myself to drop through that hole. If I did, there would be no way back. Sounds were echoing in my head. I can only describe them as the terrifying screams of fear and pain, of death and destruction. The temptation in the midst of it was to let myself go and fall with the promise, it'll all be all right, it'll all be over. That, I know, looking back, was the temptation of Satan. But as I struggled, I was also aware of another gravitational pull. It was like arms being wrapped around me, warm, comforting, safe and strong. These arms were lifting me away from the abyss towards light, an unimaginable brilliance that seemed to be devouring the darkness. I knew nothing could release me from those arms and they would never ever let me go. The terrifying screams faded to be overtaken by a cacophony of joyous sounds, the sound of celebration. I became aware of a changing scene. Gone was the emptiness of darkness, despair and desolation. Before me was the vibrant colors dancing, light that enveloped and filled me, knowing me. What had been an empty, lost void became a life-filled spectacle. Everywhere unimaginable beauty and perfection. And in the distance, there were people, illuminated by warm, soft, strong light. And it was as if I knew them, and they knew me. No one was a stranger. With that, the images began to fade. And I found myself once more bathed in sweat and lying in a hospital bed. The crisis was over. And I just share that 
because that is as real to me today as it was then. And I've held the hand of many people who have crossed the boundary, crossed the Jordan or whatever terminology you want. And so many have spoken in those final moments. He's here. He's here. You see, for us as Christians, death holds no sting. Yes, okay, we might be a bit afraid of how it might happen and the time of that death, but it holds no sting. Why? Because Jesus has said, I will come back and take you there. And all I can believe is that my time wasn't right. It wasn't my time. God had something more in store for me, for which I'm grateful. And that comes out in the prayer that I use in Psalm 23. But all I just want to reassure you is, is that God is there at that crucial moment. Mm -hmm. challenged me, and more so since retirement, is to memorise scripture. Because that is our rock. That's our rock in tough times. Psalm 23 was my rock at that rough time there in the Norfolk and Norwich. But this is my Psalm 23. And excuse me, if I get emotional, I'm not, about, I'm, not, I'm not ashamed of it, because this, to me, is real. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing, not even oxygen. This is what was going through my head. I knew as I was laying prone, I knew that I had got to enter into the battle. I'd got to take ownership of it, or else my head would explode and Satan would have the victory. And so I started repeating Psalm 23. He has made me to lay prone upon this hospital bed. He has led me to a quiet place of trust. He is restoring my oxygen and my breath. It is he who has led me along this COVID road for his name's sake. And when I find myself falling into the abyss, he pursues me and catches me and lifts me. For I have learned that however far I fall, he falls further. He brings me back to the light. For his rod and staff, they protect and keep me. He has prepared a table before me in the presence of my COVID enemies. He anoints my head with his oil of healing. My cup is full and overflowing with good things. People around me show such compassion, care and love. Good thoughts and prayers of many people surround me like a healing balm, rising as incense to God's throne. His goodness and love never leave my soul. They are my constant companions. They journey with me all the way. And I know that one, I will one day dwell forever in the house of the Lord. But not yet, for I have too much living still to live. Amen. <laughs>